Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 230. Science Faction, the beginning of a new trend. It wasn't the last one. This is... Sort of. So uh, those of you guys who listened to our last episode, you know we now are doing a new thing where we're putting out two episodes a week. One is just I Call BS. The other is everything else. Normally, the episode that you'd be hearing right now on Monday, or at least release really Sunday night, Monday morning, would be the main episode that talks about science articles. This is a rare exception. This will be an, a just I Call BS episode, and this will be the only episode for this week. Starting next week, you will get two episodes every single week. First one released Sunday night, Monday morning, will be the regular science articles, the intro bit, maybe channeling a dead scientist, maybe science fighters, whatever that is. And the second one released on Thursday will be I Call BS. Today is the one exception. I apologize. Uh, we're just getting all these gears rolling. But next week, we will jump right into it. So I hope you guys like I Call BS because we're about to get into it. But before we do, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great, um, as the Ed McMahon to your Johnny Carson. I, don't know, I always thought of you more as like a Moriarty to my uh, Sherlock. Mm. I always thought of you to, as like a Jay Leno type either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I take the compliment you threw me, and, and I say fuck you right <laughs> And the scientist for the evening, Bill. Bill, how you doing? Good. I uh, received a new middle name last week. I'm now Bill Gates Conacher. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Oh, uh, just 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 uh, dropping that last name out. Just yeah. going full exposure. Yeah. yeah. On Facebook, sometimes people go by just their middle name. So right. I'll just be Bill Gates. Yeah. On Facebook. Well, yeah. <laughs> Open some career paths for yeah. you. All right. Let's get started with I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring ring. I call BS. All right, I call BS the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS standing for bad science. So you guys ready to play? Yes, and I, I think we should do one of these episodes as Sherlock and Moriarty. Okay. I could, I could do a voice like That's this. a good Mer Moriarty <laughs> voice. Yeah, it's an important to dominating this game of trivia. Well, you do always thwart me by just losing every episode, so in a way, you are kind of that Moriarty already. You're you're like Sherlock if, like, Sherlock came in and, like, looked at a giant dump on his floor and said, Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> so then would the visiting scientist be Dr. Dr. Watson? No, I think you're more like the guest character in every episode. Like, you could be the, the sexy villain? lady love. <laughs> Who's the constable of Scotland Yard? Well, Bill Gates is his name now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or as they sometimes called him, Maze. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the train. Just like HPV, it's contagious. Now who's who's Moriarty, bitch? <laughs> yeah, I know you stole my bit. Okay, article number one. The U.S. government is now warning U.S. officials stationed in China to be wary of what they believe to be another attack on U.S. personnel using the hypothetical sonic weapon believed to have been used in Cuba a year and a half ago. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but it also mentions, please don't leave your Coke product exposed in China. That's right, because what could you're happen, gonna get, You're, you're, you're going to get urine in your Coke. That's right. You just leave <laughs> an unprotected Coke product Wait, so it does it like ultrasound can cause you to urinate, but only into da a Coke can? Damien is making a, a reference to an old racist <laughs> nursery rhyme <laughs> the, about pee pee and Coke. Well Oh, it, oh, it is, it is okay. commonly known that in China they think it's a hilarious joke yes. just to urinate in the Coca Cola of an American. And uh, to build railroads. I never got that joke. No. <laughs> All right. I would think it's hilarious to build their railroads. <laughs> All right, and Bill. This sounds like. Maybe it has happened, but that does not mean that it is good science. I will say, I don't know what, what to call that. Bad science. <laughs> okay. All right. Article number two. Researchers have transferred a memory from one animal to another using RNA. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but RNA is actually just like Amer it's Russian ASL, American Sign Language. Oh, okay. So they transferred a memory just yeah. using... What does RNA stand for? I know. It's a lot of like weird Russian... <laughs> Russian neutered non atheists. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's I don't know why that would be the name of their sign language, but sure. Yeah, it's uh, Putin's Putin's Russia, man. Yeah, that's Could, the way. Don't even. That's the way. All right, and Bill. So ribonucleic acid, I believe, was used to transfer memory. I think I actually read this study. Oh, so I'm going to say science. Okay, article number three. 
Researchers have found that while any vape flavor can cause harm, the cherry flavor seems specifically bad because the chemicals used to create it cause increased lung infections. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. I mean, in defense of cherry, it's the best flavor of all the artificial fruit flavors. Right. No, I feel like it would be like one of the novelty flavors, like poop or HPV. Did they, <laughs> <laughs> what, what hookah bar are you going to? <laughs> like Birdie Bot's every flavor vape. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very novelty. It's hip. You could have a feces flavored vape in case you were ever curious. What... I, be, I feel like you innovated that a long time ago with some more, let's just call it mundane techniques. They were less technologically involved. Yeah, it's not so much vapor. Yeah. Well, it is. <laughs> I mean, technically, every fart is a vapor. <laughs> All right, and Bill. This could definitely be true. Um, some of my, my research actually involves sizing the droplets that yeah. we could use to to treat infections in the lungs. Okay. It's certainly possible. I heard that, that the size doesn't really matter, though. It's the girth. <laughs> yeah. It's the girth of the vapor. Well, it's the, it's the depth of the penetration, but that's uh, dependent on the size. Okay. I mean, I thought it was more the motion of the ocean. But <laughs> so, Bill, you think it is science? Uh, I think that it is science. Okay. And lastly, article number four. A deadly new virus outbreak in India may be the next global epidemic and has already killed 70% of those infected. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but I mean, isn't this just like Monday for India? I mean, <laughs> you have like a... Global pandemic with just a bunch of people dying, 70% of them. Well, you, they have rivers of feces that just flow through the town. I mean, That's, there's, that's there's, true. I, I heard they called that a vape, though. <laughs> 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 All right, and Bill. I'm going to say on, on the, the side of hope, that this is bad science. All right, let's go back and see how you guys did following at home and see how you did. Article number one. The U.S. government is now warning U.S. officials stationed in China to be wary of what they believe is another attack on U.S. personnel using a hypothetical sonic weapon believed to have been used in Cuba a year and a half ago. We covered this story quite a few times. The main of cons- uh, the idea that possibly the Cubans were using some kind of ultrasonic frequency, we looked into the science behind it. Almost everyone agrees that that's not really physically possible. Even though these people came back with brain damage and other issues, we think it might be a case of mass hysteria. They seem to think it has happened again. This article is indeed science. The U.S. government has just warned their officials in China. The American diplomats working in the U.S. consulate at Gaozhou was diagnosed with a mild traumatic brain injury after experiencing subtle and vague but abnormal sensations of sound and pressure. Also, a very foul taste in his Coke beverage. Right, right, right. That might have been it. (laughs) We still don't know if any of this is real because the danger of psychosomatic illness is it travels at the speed of information. And so if this guy knew about the stuff going on, uh, you know, in Cuba and experienced something else and then translated that, he might believe that this is the case and he might still be suffering from the same psychosomatic illness that people in Cuba did. It might also be that it's a viral infection. It might be that it has nothing to do with the Cuba thing or... There might be another type of weapon. The issue that the scientists had when they were examining this before, when they were saying, hey, you're using supersonic weapons to do this, is it would only make sense if you could actually hear the sound. So these people were saying there were sounds that they couldn't really hear. The way sound weapons, that, as we know, work is their amplitude. They have to be loud to work. Like we have these sound weapons we use to disperse crowds and stuff. It works because it's loud, you know, and if it's not loud for you to hear and it's not causing you pain in your ears, it's not doing that, it probably doesn't have the power to actually cause damage to your body. Now, Bill, I know you, you actually do some research along these lines, right? Yeah, so there, there are some, some hypotheses about uh, affecting the cellular function using sound, but they're very far from being confirmed. Okay. Um, the rationale is that if you have a high enough frequency, it can actually cause lysis of cells. What's but lysis? You're rupturing the, the uh, cell membrane. Okay. Frequency would that be, right. would that be audible to somebody? It would not be audible. Okay. It would be way, way higher frequency than anyone could If hear. you were rupturing cells, would that not affect, for instance, the skin cells first? Because they are the ones in direct contact it, to the it air. It probably wouldn't even affect any healthy cells. So okay. the, the, um, the hypothesized effect is that it would have a much greater effect in cancerous cells. This is like okay. maybe a cancer treatment. But like I said, this is like very preliminary research. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the cells in question would have to be in contact with the air in which the sound is moving, correct? Like this would not work 
if it's buried in your brain right yeah so that what we call the uh, attenuation length mm -hmm. of sound uh depends on the medium that's traveling through and so it as soon as it hits your skull, it's these waves can't penetrate your skull. Yeah, so that that's, to me, one of the big issues. Like, if somebody said, hey, there was this weird sonic noise from this weird thing, and all of a sudden my skin started bleeding, that could at least seem to me to be somewhat plausible because that's what's in contact with the air that is carrying the sound. But the idea that it's affecting the inner part of your brain, so it's going through your skin, through your muscle, through your skull, and then still vibrating and hitting some part of your brain seems so far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if you had an implanted ultrasonic yeah, device okay. in a specific area of your brain it could affect the cells around it potentially but it certainly wouldn't be traveling from somewhere where you can't even see it through your skull yeah. and then hurting your brain yeah it's just it's scientifically it doesn't make any sense but yet we removed a bunch of diplomats from cuba last year and then now we're issuing official warnings to diplomats in china and it seems like there's a disconnect between the politics and the science what if scientifically it is a weapon it's just not a sonic weapon. You could make more sense with that. But also, what is the same type of thing? What is going to affect you at that level? You know, what a is going to be a psychosomatic gun? <laughs> <laughs> a gun that shoots you and then creates a psychosomatic illness of some kind. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's influence. You know, maybe it's subtle influence. Maybe they're finding ways to, to subconsciously influence people in psychosomatic ways, and that's what's doing it. Now we a also, hypno gun. Yeah. There are physical effects. We're seeing things that are equivalent to like TBIs, but it could be... Sorry, what's a TBI? A traumatic brain injury. Okay. Though it could be that these are pre-existing in these people and they're unrelated to this. You know, a lot of times you're a diplomat because you might have some military background. You might just have some injuries from playing football. Some of them reported hearing injuries, but they're older people. You know, in the Cuba instance, they were saying, hey, I had some hearing injuries. Yeah, but you are at the age where we would expect you to have some hearing things. It is really hard to pinpoint this down, but I'll tell you what. If it ever comes out that there is some kind of crazy new weapon they're using, I really want to know what it is, because I'm interested in the physics behind this. How would you impact somebody's brain while not impacting the rest of their body? How would you do it from afar without them knowing? Like Bill said, it would be one thing if these guys were able to get implants or, or something like that. Then this starts to make sense. Well, we haven't found any of those. No. And, you know, these people have gone through extensive medical trials to try and figure out what's wrong with them microwaves cook things from the inside out maybe it's a low-grade microwave that cooks just that part of the brain i'm still going with the main scientists on this that i think it's probably psychosomatic but i do have one caveat that i think it could be we know that similar injuries can be caused by certain viruses now of course we did extensive studies on the uh, americans that came back from cuba and none of them had those that does not mean that you couldn't genetically engineer a virus to infect somebody, cause these injuries, and essentially autophagy and die and then not leave any remains. I would be way more likely to think this is a biological agent that is well hidden because we don't know what we're looking for as opposed to a sonic one that seems to defy the laws of physics. When you program a virus to autophage, does it automatically at a certain point just find a closet and a necktie and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and David it's, Carradine itself? Yeah, it just it finds another piece of RNA and <laughs> wraps it around. <laughs> All right, article number two, researchers have transferred a memory from one animal to another using RNA. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science, and the catch was, it was a snail. So, we talked about RNA a few weeks back when we talked about the origin of all life. It might be an RNA-based thing. We now know how that might happen. But also, we talked about how we have RNA in our own body. Those of you guys who, you know, had some basic biology classes, molecular biology classes, you might know that while DNA holds our genetic blueprint, it's RNA that goes over, reads that genetic blueprint, and transcribes it into proteins. Those proteins are what actually do things. So think of DNA. DNA is the book. RNA is the guy reading the book and making it happen. So it is very important, even in our own bodies today. And you wouldn't necessarily think of RNA as, as a method for transferring information, but at least in these snail models, it seems to be. And you might say, how do you, how do you have a memory in a snail? And then how do you measure that? Well, as most scientists do, you torture the snail, right? <laughs> so what they did is they gave electric shocks to these snails and the, the snails received five shocks, one every 20 minutes, and then five more 24 hours later. The shocks enhanced the snail's defensive withdrawal reflex where they kind of crunch in, they bring their tail into their body. So it's learning that, hey, I'm getting shocked, and therefore I'm going to crunch in much easier. No when the research how fast the snail tried to run away. Right. Just... <laughs> well, when, the, when they would then tap the snail later on, they found that those had been given the shocks displayed a defensive contraction that lasted an average of 50 seconds, which is basically just a, a very simple type of learning. This is basic Pavlovian learning. You know, there's, there's as simple as you get. They have learned that there is something going on with these shocks. They have learned to contract. 
They then extracted RNA from the nervous systems of the snails that received the shocks the day after the second series of shocks, and also from snails that did not receive them. Then the RNA from each group was injected into new snails that had not received any shocks, and they wanted to see what happens. It turns out that the new snails that got the RNA from the shock snails responded the same way the shock snails did. That's really neat. They've transferred... I mean, you could call it a memory. I would call it a reaction. They've, they've transferred an innate Pavlovian reaction from one animal to another simply by doing RNA. Very, very interesting. Has some implications for how we store memory, how we process things, our ability to move information around with, in between different animals, and you know how our brains work in general in terms of storing, accessing, and retrieving information. How far are we away from me just getting a shot to learning Kung Fu? Yeah, oh, so you want to be like, like a shot that gives me all Neo. the memory of somebody who just spent twenty years kung fu, training in kung fu. Well, and what's interesting too is, you know, what can you learn? Is this just going to be a motor response? Is this going to be? Could you could you find a way to adapt this? You know, to some other type of learning. I've always thought if we did enough detailed MRI studies to really figure out the exact mechanisms of learning, and we know some of it, we know how we interpret things, and it goes through the thalamus, and it goes to the different parts of the neocortex, and it gets stored by the amygdala. We know certain things, but if we got really good at it, could we mimic that through electrical signals, let's say transcranial direct current stimulation? We put this big helmet on your head, we induce your brain to do certain things, and in the same way your body would normally learn something by doing it, we can replicate the effect by forcing your brain to react in the way as somebody would if they were doing it. And if you could do that and find a way to do that in a more efficient manner than happens naturally, could you download Kung Fu? Could you put this helmet on and by going through this entire process, teach somebody to do that? Would that only work for conceptual information? Could you only learn the idea of things? Or would you have muscle memory and be able to actually do the physical martial arts that you are trying to do? At what point could we delete memories? Yeah, I'd that's like a big to... one. Uh, we, we've actually found certain uh, elements of being able to delete memories now, which is very interesting. It's called you mean drinking. selectively, right? Because yes. anyone could delete it. Yeah, that's true. You just fucking shoot just yourself in the head and head, you got yeah. no memories. Yeah. Um, Drink a lot. Uh, I'm, or, I'm a... or you just erase the tattoos on that memento guy. You take away all his memories. <laughs> I'm not a biologist or a geneticist, but this doesn't seem that surprising to me um, based on the the previous studies in epigenetics where like your like for example the the study where the dad who's exercised a lot mm -hmm. there's like a, a change in his child due sure. to that so like that's the methyl groups that get put on and therefore your kids can actually inherit acquired characteristics it's almost like lamarckian evolution it's yeah, like that's so, what happened with the manning children archie manning's children that's he right threw so many football touchdowns that they both look like they have down syndrome <laughs> <laughs> not but the third one though the one who doesn't play essentially like the the things the, the the things that the traits that you have are not just genetic they're yes. also how your genes are being read yes. which is exactly what rna does it reads your genes so how like in terms of can you learn kung fu or could mm -hmm. you learn conceptual things I, based on this study it, it seems like you could only learn things through this method that are already in your genetics yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be able to go beyond what your cognitive capabilities are. The snail couldn't learn calculus, right? What's interesting to me is the idea that RNA, which we think of as, as a transcriber of genetic information, would carry what is otherwise considered cognitive information or behavioral information. That is what's well, really it's like, interesting. It's like metacognitive information. Yeah. It's like the reading and then copying, they're like you, it gets to choose which and how to copy these things, mm -hmm. right? So like if you have... A book and you're quoting from that book the quotes that you choose matter a lot yeah. in how you're conveying that message to say the audience yeah and so maybe what it is is essentially short circuiting the part where it reads it and does it you've just taken it from another animal you've given it to this one it's read it from one and, and it's going into another it is really interesting i don't think this would work with humans with the way our brain works i think it works with them because with that kind of autonomic nervous system the rna is more important for direct action because you're producing the proteins, and the proteins themselves are doing the action. There's not a lot of thought behind it. It's pretty much autonomous. Mm -hmm. I think this would be much harder to do in humans, but like I said, I think there might be other ways, things like transcranial direct current stimulation, really involved fMRI studies that we might be able to mimic a similar effect and learn. We've already seen certain very interesting studies where we're able to take a picture, 
reads, have somebody look at a picture, read their brain, what it does, what it looks like when it does that, record that, transmit it to another person, and have that other person tell you what that picture is. That's really cool. It's a that's, dick. Oh my god, it's yeah. a dick. Every time. Every time. <laughs> god damn it. That's basically digital telepathy. It's still in its nascent stages. It's been about two or three reports since 2016 looking into that. It's still, you know, kind of blurry pixelation and stuff, but we're getting to that point, and you get a good enough to that point. I mean, you can cure things you wouldn't even think of, like like blindness. You know, if you have blindness, not because of a brain issue, but because of your eyes or an optical nerve issue, and you can just transmit directly to somebody's brain what's going on around them, there's no need for eyes anymore. You know, you could have cameras out there that would see just fine. Here's a basic, more basic-ish biology question. So if RNA is your reader, it's Gilbert Godfrey reading a book, the novelization of your DNA, right? Genotype doesn't necessarily equal phenotype. Right. Okay, so is the difference like the RNA is wrote like it's an, the difference between genotype and phenotype is the accent of the RNA? Like if, if Rosie Perez is the reader versus it's in, in, Sir in, Gilbert Gottfried. In reality, yeah. you don't think of the RNA, you think of the proteins that it makes. So the actual function is done by proteins. All that the DNA does is give you the blueprint to build proteins. The RNA reads the blueprint and turns them through the ribosomes into proteins. The proteins themselves are what do the action. And well, What creates the difference between genotype and phenotype? Phenotype. A lot of stuff. So it can be that translation from one to the other. It can be the proteins that are put out. It can be the methyl groups that get put on in epigenetic situations in which your your genotype is seemingly changed by what's going on around you. But it could also be a physical thing that happens to that body in the world. You know, you can be born with the genetics for normal feet, but have the phenotype for small feet if you got your feet bound, you know, when you were a young kid. So there your genotype and phenotype don't match each other. It has nothing to do with any cellular function. It's because my father had a deep respect for the Asian community. That, that's true. And, and he wished I was a girl. Yeah. All right. Article number three. Researchers have found that while any vape flavor can cause harm, the cherry flavor seems specifically bad because the chemicals used to create it cause increased lung infections. Damien thinks this is false. Bill thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. It was the cinnamon flavor. So we've talked about vaping dangers before, uh, things like popcorn lung, which is terrifying because we don't know how to solve it. We don't know what it is. It appears in some people, but not others, and we don't know why. Surprisingly delicious. Yeah. Now, overall, studies still seem to show that it is better to vape in most circumstances than smoke. However, we don't have all the long-term data, and we are seeing a lot of issues. If you have a chance, you want to stay away as much as possible from the liquid stuff, so the stuff you would see in a vape pen. If you are going to vape, whether it's cannabis or tobacco or anything else, if you can do the dry herb itself, then you're really doing yourself a favor in terms of lowering your carcinogenic rate from smoking or doing anything else, and there doesn't seem to be negative side effects. You could do lip tobacco. Yeah. Well, just so you know, when they when we do scientific studies on cannabis, the way they, they take it is through a dry herb vaporizer because it's considered the safest. It has very very little chance of causing lung infections. Safer than edibles? Edibles is a different thing. You get a different chemical compound when you eat it than when you inhale it, imbibe it through smoke or vaporizing. So when you eat it, your liver actually changes the compound so you have a more hallucinogenic effect. You, It is safer to eat, but it's a different study at that point. Plus, you get a really unproductive gut microbiome. Right, it's <laughs> super lazy. It's like they're not even taking nutrients out of. You're shit. like you're like everything you poo out just comes out, and you're like, "What are you doing, guts? Are you just sitting out there watching adults swim the entire day?" Yeah, that's a full hamburger. That yeah, I, out. I, I can hear fish music coming from my intestines. <laughs> my intestines slash Damien's vape. <laughs> Indeed, on top of the normal stuff, the normal problems you can get from these liquid vaporizers, there is a chemical used to create the cinnamon flavor called cinnamaldide, and the chemical seems to affect the cilia in our lungs. I have actually smelled this chemical. Oh, really? Uh, we had it in a, in a previous startup that I was part of. It's awful smelling. Really? It does not smell like cinnamon. It's gross. That's funny. It's it's supposedly really bad for the cilia. So the, the yeah. little guys in your lungs, they're like little hairs, and they keep foreign bodies from coming down into your lungs. They're essentially like a whole bunch of little arms that just push stuff like get out get out everybody get out it it kind of slows them down almost to a paralysis so right after you've inhaled this particular chemical all the cilia which are normally waving around and trying to push stuff out they kind of freeze and they stop and then little <laughs> particles and things that can have infectious agents in them get into your lungs it increases the lung infection rate by something like 10 to 25 percent it's like a superpower. Like they can pause time for yeah, cilia yeah, yeah, yeah. and then come in and like ninja attack them. <laughs> uh, uh, for some reason, you picture like cilia, like the hair. I pictured like chains all over the hair, like cat calling the air as it goes by. Hey, baby, why are you just going into the lungs? Come on, spend some time over here. <laughs> now you're thinking of sus cilia. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, indeed. So it's something to think about. You know, ideally, you don't use any of those liquid vape flavors. But if you do, why don't you just go ahead and stay away from the cinnamon? And Bill, if they bring that back to your lab, tell them to fuck off and get that stuff out of there. And you stop bad mouth and cherry. <laughs> That's right. I will never do that again. All right, article number four. A deadly new viral outbreak in India may be the next global epidemic and has already killed 70% of those infected. Damien thinks this is true. Bill thinks this is false. And this one is... Science and it's terrifying. By the way, congratulations, Damien. My racist answer against India proved to be victory. <laughs> Damien's first ever victory. Congratulations. Indeed, this is terrifying. <laughs> it's called Nipah. It's a terrifying virus. So this is actually it's not a very terrifying name. No, it's not. Nipah. Nipah. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys saw the 2011 movie with Lawrence Fishburne, Contagion, this is the virus that is based on. It has been around, we've known about it since 1999. It's endemic to Southeast Asia and it goes all the way down to Australia. It was the result of a party. It was the right. result of partying like it was a certain year. I actually think the, the broader family goes to Australia. I think this one is mainly Southeast Asia. First discovered in Malaysia and it comes from different species of bats. So it starts in bats. It's been endemic in them for a very long time. And it transfers sometimes through pigs into human beings. It's terrifying. Some of the infections that we've had, and we have these micro little infections sprout up since 1999, have killed 30% of people. But this most recent one in India is killing 70% of those who are infected. That's terrifying. It's spread through saliva and bodily fluids. Right now, it is not particularly infectious, and that's why it's not killing everybody with that kind of death rate. If you think of something like Ebola, which itself isn't particularly infectious, on average, one person can, can infect one to three people. Right now, one person with this is not infecting even one more person. So we have these little localized outbreaks, and then they slowly die out because you're not replacing the same person or infecting more people. It's, it's, a very, it's a slow rate. But if something changes, which it does all the time when viruses cross into humans, that can be really bad. Because let's say this thing gets even a moderate level of infectiousness. One person infects five people. Imagine a 70% death rate with one person infecting five people in the most populated place on earth. You know, you would have massive death. It's very, very scary. And right now we don't even know where these people caught it because we tested the bats in the area where this new outbreak is. We can't find it there. We tested the pigs. We can't find it there. It's scary when you don't know where it came from because you can't stop it from popping up again. You can't just go wipe out the bat population or do what we did in Malaysia and kill the, the you know, hundreds and hundreds of pigs that were all infected. You can't do that. Uh, in the Malaysian example, and that was back in the day, 300 people got infected. I think 100-something of them died. That's a big deal, man. If, if, if that's your neighborhood and a third of the people drop out and all your pigs have to be slaughtered, that's a big deal. But once we bump up to 70%, you're talking about global pandemic proportions. Maybe if they were to elevate the pig to the same status as the cow in the country, this whole thing could be avoided. If, if nobody ate the pig, that's the break in the chain. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you actually just have to be around the pig. So it's it's really just sharing. Like, What's the point of just hanging out with a pig? I mean, like, yeah. unless you're a George, the entire country of George Clooney's? <laughs> well, there's a similar virus that w we found in Australia a, few, a while back uh, that infected horses and the horse trainers and stuff that were with them. And it, it was a really small outbreak. It happened in one horse that then infected a, a group of 14 horses in a stable. The two people who were there, I think the owner and the stable master guy, they both got it. One guy lived, one guy died. And they just got it from contact with the fluids of the sick horses. Like the, they think the number one thing was like uh, some excrement from their nose, you know, was what got them sick. It's terrifying because not only is this something that can affect you for that reason, but think of the idea of pork. You know, you're not raising thousands of pigs for yourself and your family. You're raising them for meat export. So if that meat gets beyond the village, then so does that virus. And bats, I mean... They fly. That's the thing. So if those bats are infected and they're walk, they're getting around and spreading that to, to other areas. And bats often feed on the blood of cows, yes. right? So they could be spreading that to then it, other livestock. It could be. Now, cows are, diff are a are little bit harder. We tend to get infected by the same viruses and bacteria as both bats and pigs. Not as much with cows, but it can happen. Most bats are infectious because of their feces, their droppings yes. and the stuff they create. It's not because... Cause feces most, and saliva. So most bats eat... Insects and fruit, right? Right. So what happens is these bats are around the, the trees. And injustice. Yeah. <laughs> these bats are around the trees that these pigs are feeding around. The bats will eat. Uh, they'll either have guano. Their bat droppings will come and the pigs will eat that. Or the bats will nibble on some fruit. The fruit will fall from the tree. It's got their saliva on we it. The pigs will eat that. teach four-legged animals to stop eating shit. Yes. That's... 
Good luck with that with pigs. <laughs> That's not exactly what they're known for. That is very scary. This is also the, fir- the first outbreak in southern India before we were in other parts of Southeast Asia. Now that this is spreading further geographically, that also adds a whole element of danger to it because it adds an ability, an, an inability to contain it to certain parts of the world. Man, this is one of those things. Write the word Nipah down, N-I-P-A-H. This is something that you're going to hear about. This will likely be the next Ebola, whether that means that it's just a scare that happens and pops up through parts of the world, killing dozens or hundreds of people in little groups and then going away, and then everybody gets super scared about it in the media or not. That's terrifying. And the difference is Ebola was one of those things you kind of had to get from dirty water. You weren't likely to get it if you were just around somebody, though you could. It was very Unless unlikely. You're chomping on some delicious chimp meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be really unlikely. This is something that can be spread through saliva, which is much easier and much more common. Now, right now, we talked about the infectious rate is very low. If that changes, given its method of transfer, unlike something like Ebola, for Ebola to become a pandemic, it would literally have to have a viral transformation from one form of infection to another, the type of trans- transformation we've literally never seen in a virus. It would be a, a once in a many, many lifetimes type transition. It could happen. It's very unlikely. For this to be a global pandemic, the infectious rate just has to increase. That is not hard at all. That happens every day with different viruses. But as somebody who's known you for a long time, (laughs) you got me up in arms. I I built an underground bunker because you said bird flu was going to be the next thing. (laughs) I don't remember saying that, A. But but bird flu, H1N1, uh, H1N5, all of those actually did cause a lot of damage. We we know that those can be big issues. You call wolf virus an awful lot. You are a a pubescent boy who... (laughs) I was the one saying the Ebola wasn't a big deal, and it, when it, when in the news was flipping out about it, I was the one saying, everybody temper it. It's not the type of disease that can be transferred that easily. In a first world country, it really is only something that can happen in a third world country with poor sanitation and open sewers. It does not happen in a place like the United States. This is something that would happen in a place like the United States. If this has a few little tweaks, this is it would not take much to make this a really, really big deal. It's just something you should be aware of and something that you should be able to recognize the difference between the type of scare that this would cause and the type of scare that Ebola would cause. With just a few simple tweaks, you say. <laughs> Sorry, I was just a super villain walking. Oh, Moriarty! <laughs> But I'm off to my lab. All right. Congratulations, Damien, on your first ever victory in I Call BS. I guess the whole new format is working for you. You finally won one. Very good. You know, I know you're being passive aggressive to like just to like normal people standards, but this is actually like the most congratulatory you've yeah. ever been. You've barely insulted me once. Yeah, fuck off. Okay. <laughs> And thank you, audience, for coming back to Science Faction 230, where you learned about the potential sonic weapons in China. How researchers have transferred a memory from one animal to another using RNA. Why cinnamon-flavored vape can hurt your lungs. And how a possible new deadly virus outbreak might be the beginning of the next global pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 231. Thank goodness it was cinnamon. I swear to God, if it was semen-flavored vape, bring on the lung disease. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. (laughs) 